Thank you. I um, also appreciate the uh, opportunity to, uh, to come here and uh, participate in this meeting. Um, just as a bit of background, my, my interest in this area stems back to um, 1984 uh, when I mentioned to uh, Dr. Shear that I was thinking of doing a PhD and he encouraged me to, uh, to talk to a guy by the name of Steven Spielberg and uh, the rest is kind of history. Uh, my interest has run the, the gamut from um, replacing hepatic microsomes uh, in the, the Spielberg lymphocyte assay with purified P450s through to um, looking at anti-P450 antibodies and anticonvulsant hypersensitivity um, to the current interest in improving the information that um, is available for these reactions and, and other um, um, adverse drug reactions in a pediatric setting. And so I'll start off, first of all, by saying that um, there is no current initiative analogous to the um, drug-induced liver injury network addressing uh, severe cutaneous adverse drug reactions in the, um, uh, the U.S. Um, there's a group called the Institute for Safe Medication Practices that periodically reviews um, this type of information that's been reported to the FDA adverse event reporting system. Um, as a Canadian about to become an American citizen, I thought I would include um, the Canadian um, initiative in this um, area. And, uh, and, and uh, what led me to what leads me to the, the topic that I'm really going to discuss is the fact that um, one of the many, many times Dr. Carlton, Bruce Carlton, who heads up the, uh, the Canadian Initiative, will bemoan the fact that uh, he needs to uh, renew the funding for the infrastructure of his network every five years to keep it alive. And I think uh, the current experience with the uh, drug-induced liver injury network shows that the survival of many, many of these um, um, networks is dependent upon grant funding. And so what we try to do at our institution is to build a program that is perceived to have value to the institution so that the collection of adverse drug reaction related information um, can be paid for out of the operations of the hospital but also feed um, research initiatives. And so uh, the first thing I'm going to do is just uh, show this, uh, um, uh, this text that I've pulled out of the report by the Institute for Safe Medication Practices um, in January of last year, showing the, the types of um, uh, the drugs that have been associated with severe skin reactions in uh, FAIRS. And you can see at the top of the list um, is uh, Lamotrigine. Um, followed by ibuprofen and then cotrimoxazole. So this is certainly in, in uh, fitting with a number of the um, um, other international initiatives. This is a, um, a map of um, the uh, 51st state that shows all of the um, sites. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> So that, that actually, that wasn't one of the tests, uh, one of the questions on the citizenship exam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, I said Puerto Rico. Yeah, right. <clears throat> okay. Um, <clears throat> so the uh, the uh, the blue circles uh, on this map represent the initial, uh, what used to be called the GAT C um, um, network, and then when they renewed their funding, they had to have a slightly different focus, or else they couldn't get funded. Um, and so that became the Canadian Pharmacogenomics Network for Drug Safety, and they added um, adult sites in the, in the red. But this is a, a nationwide initiative that has standardized data capture and uh, provides data. Most of their work to date has been on things like cisplatin ototoxicity and uh, adriamycin cardiotoxicity, but they've also replicated the, um, uh, the results, the associations between um, um, 3101 and 1502 uh, for carbamazepine hypersensitivity in children. Now, um, we have participated in uh, the international, the ISEC, the International Severe Events uh, uh, Consortium, as have other American um, institutions. But, and one of the challenges that we found was that uh, there was an awful lot of work related to re entering um, the data from the way that we collect it into whatever platform is being used to collect uh, data for 
uh, whatever organization is doing the study. Now, it is worth noting that um, one of the mandates for Joint Commission accreditation is um, ADR reporting. Um, but prior to this initiative, it was done very poorly at our institutions. We would only have, on average, 10 to 12 adverse events that were reported to our Pharmacy and Therapeutics Committee every quarter. And while we believe that we provide a high quality of care for our patients, um, we doubt that that uh, means that we only have 10 or 12 adverse events every three months. And so um, this led us to consider uh, development of some um, um, systems that would allow us ultimately to um, um, implement preemptive interventions in the event that we were able to identify children who were at high risk for a severe um, event. We also wanted a system, so we wanted to improve the quality of information that's in the electronic medical record itself, but we also wanted to, to have it there in a form that it could be easily extracted to participate in um, um, different research initiatives. And at our institution, we call this the Pharmacogenomics of Pediatric Drug Safety, or PAPEDS program. Now, the PAPEDS program, the research program, is, falls under another larger umbrella that we call Goldilocks for genomic and ontogeny-linked dose individualization and clinical optimization for kids. And it's the concept of finding the right drug or the dose that is not too big, not too small, just right for children, for those of you who forget uh, the story of Goldilocks and Three Bears. But this is all part of um, a program of our uh, pediatric clinical pharmacology program that is designed to improve the uh, use of medications in kids. And so the program is currently led by a clinical pharmacology trained pediatric infectious disease specialist who also <laughs> heads up our um, antibiotic stewardship program and who has an interest in uh, cotrimoxazole hypersensitivity as well. In the past uh, year, with a full-time dedicated clinical pharmacist and other ancillary personnel, um, in fact, the, so the program is run out of the Division of Clinical Pharmacology, which is a division in the Department of Pediatrics. Uh, we rely on some assistance from the Department of Pharmacy as well. Um, but we had 803 unique ADRs that were entered into this system in the past year. And uh, although the, the clinical pharmacist in our program uh, was responsible for uh, about half of those, there were um, in more than 20 other healthcare practitioners in the institution who contributed to the reporting. And so what we've attempted to do is to um, um, standardize and get the data into the electronic medical record in a form that can be extract extractable as, um, as um, defined fields. And I have to thank, he's not here so he won't be publicly embarrassed, but I have to thank uh, Dr. Dan Roden from Vanderbilt who five years ago uh, visited our institution when we were considering um, uh, developing a, um, a Vanderbilt type repository and de-identified electronic uh, medical record system. And he encouraged us at that time to, do, uh, to work on getting data into the electronic medical record in a form that made it uh, much easier to extract. And so we took that advice. And the next few slides, with whatever time I have available, is going to show you um, the way that this, uh, uh, the data are collected. And I will say that uh, the platform that we use for the research side of the operation is uh, Discover E. It's the same platform that um, uh, the International uh, Severe Events Consortium, Se Severe Adverse Events Consortium, used for um, their data capture. And it was facilitated by having in Kansas City um, Cerner Corporation. Um, we also use the Cerner uh, EMR. But uh, here is um, uh, some of the information that goes into the electronic medical records, some general information, list of uh, drugs uh, with a field for um, other, uh, and then an initial type. Now, this is, until this time, everything went into the electronic medical record as an allergy. And uh, you may not be able to see on, um, in this panel here, but we now break this, um, we call them adverse reactions, and we break it up into allergy, hypersensitivity, uh, side effect, unknown, religious uh, preference, precaution, newly reported, newly documented, uh, and then a final uh, type. Also, there is classification for severity, um, which is intended to provide the practitioners with advice as to whether the same drug or, or drug class should, could be given again or avoided. Um, we also have, uh, we don't like rash, although rash is one of the words that uh, triggers um, us to get involved. The other thing is that on the banner bar, 
because we know that clinicians themselves are not interested in going through this process. They don't have the time. We now have on the banner bar um, a button that anybody who suspects uh, an adverse reaction of occurring, they hit that button and it triggers our group into action to, uh, to uh, initiate the documentation. So here are all of the descriptions of rash that we like people to um, tick off when present, where it's located, um, and then uh, we capture information related to, um, to uh, medications, and then uh, the suspicious uh, drugs, and then the Naranjo algorithm is included in the EMR, but we are also uh, having people go, we also go through the Liverpool al algorithm uh, so that we can do some comparative work as well. Um, finally, uh, how is it treated? And uh, here's an example of, uh, of uh, nausea and vomiting to uh, amoxicillin that was reported as an allergy but is recoded as a side effect so that you know you can give amoxicillin again. And uh, then these are just some screen captures from the discovery database uh, that uh, the trigger for the research project is um, an adverse drug reaction of medium uh, uh, severity or greater. And uh, um, again, uh, similar data fields. So just to, uh, just to uh, finish up, there is no current national initiative. Um, our goal is to, con uh, to hopefully convince healthcare systems through maybe a system that can be adopted by others that ADR surveillance programs do have value to the institution and data collection and um, fine phenotype detail should be a part of regular practice. We need to standardize nomenclature. And um, having the infrastructure already in place would allow research funding to go more to the research or the science than to uh, in infrastructure that needs to be resustained on a regular basis. So I'll just close by acknowledging um, the slides from the CPNDS from Bruce Carlton. Jennifer Lowry is a clinical pharmacology and clinical toxicology trained uh, general pediatrician who did all the heavy lifting to get this system in place in our institution. Jen Goldman is the ID specialist who now heads it up. Uh, the other individuals help, uh, help with the data collection. And also the content of the data, um, I'm indebted to David Kaufman and Alan Mitchell at the Sloan Epidemiology Center uh, because a lot of the content was adapted from their um, earlier involvement in, um, in this type of uh, work. So thank you. Thank you very much. We have a few minutes for questions related to this presentation before going into a general discussion. So this is a very nice initiative. How do you then use this to convince healthcare system that there's value, and how do you define the value here? That's so difficult, I find. If you don't do health economic study to show the value of predictive testing or so. Or yes. Uh, yeah. The, the the value demonstrating the value is um, uh, collecting objective evidence of the value is is um, um, is somewhat difficult. Our institution um, kind of gets it, so they don't need to be convinced. But getting other institutions to um, to say, well, we're not going to do this until you can um, demonstrate to us that it's um, cost effective, I don't know. Um, one of the ways that we've been considering is that hospital charges, um, the bulk of the hospital charges tend to occur in the first two days, two to three days of a hospitalization, and then the, you know, the revenue, if you will, drops down after that. And so uh, we're wondering if one way that we can do it is to show, uh, demonstrate that we're lengthening hospital stays, um, hopefully by fewer um, iatrogenic events, and maybe that'll be cost effective. Um, and this, this is definitely something that we struggle with. We are fortunate to be in an institution who um, um, values a culture of safety and is willing to see whether this will pay off. Mark, if I can just uh, add to that, Mark Williams, uh, Geisinger, uh, we've spent a lot of time thinking about this, and I would just add two things. One is, in this realm, uh, one of the levers that you can really pry on pretty hard is patient safety. That's a big issue for all healthcare systems um, because they're being scrutinized about patient safety. So avoidable events, uh, using this type of information, uh, provides an opportunity where you may not have to make as much of a uh, cost case. Um, as you would in other cases, and in particular, we're not talking about this in this meeting, but if you think about CYP2D6 and opioids, which are 
high visibility in terms of patient safety, um, that's something that some institutions have been able to um, use to get that implemented. The second thing is we use the term cost effectiveness, um, but healthcare systems aren't interested in cost effectiveness in the sense of how we usually use the term, which is sort of a societal perspective cost effectiveness. That doesn't mean anything to them. What Steve is actually describing is not cost effectiveness, but it's really a business case. Uh, for that. And you can use economic tools for this, but you have to model it from the perspective of the healthcare delivery system so that it's relevant. And we've actually published um, several papers on how to, uh, how to do this. Um, but once you can actually uh, explain to them in the context of what it means uh, related to the business case, then you can really move this forward. And the first one is always the hardest. And, and if you're successful with that, um, then it's a little bit easier going forward. That's uh, very interesting. This, this would be only hospitalized children? Or how do, do you capture children on the outside who have uh, an adverse reaction and are not hospitalized, say? Uh, that's, a, uh, that's a very interesting um, question. So once we started doing this, we realized that um, um, there were still a lot of uh, adverse drug reactions that we were missing. And um, mostly these were the uh, uh, children that were coming into the uh, urgent care or emergency department with a um, chief complaint of an adverse drug reaction where the ED made a diagnosis of an adverse drug reaction, but it never got entered into the system. Right. Um, and so now... Hard to follow, too. Yeah. yeah and so now, um, <clears throat> like most of the initiatives at our institution, it takes a committed uh, clinician. Uh, to get involved, and um, it turned out that one of the urgent care docs came to um, Dr. Goldman and saying, you know, here's this uh, um, situation. We knew it was happening because we, we do monitor by um, um, ICD-9 codes, and so now we have an urgent care um, physician who is going through, um, um, she's gone through the first nine months, 202 um, cases uh, for, for 2014 to get the documentation in the system. I doubt that we are capturing a, um, everything right now. We don't have it in our um, outpatient clinics. Um, no. But we hope to capture everything once we have the committed uh, uh, faculty members. Um, Dr. Thank you so much. I'm so impressed by the system you put in place. I wish we could implement it nationally. And as I talked yesterday, I have 5,000 signatures here of this petition from people from all over the United States in Naples, Italy, saying, my child died of this, and it went unreported to every single drug out there. And you know, if there's any way we can help to try to get awareness out there, and get a system in place to make it safer for the consumer, we'd be more than willing to help. And I thank you for this, because I'm very impressed by how developed this is and how organized it is. Thank you. Thank you. So I, uh, just to add to that, I would say that um, um, the, the system that I showed you is not hard-coded into Cerner. The, this exists as power forms um, that are on top. And, and uh, you know, there really isn't I don't know enough about the uh, medical informatics to know, but certainly the content that's being captured can be uh, put into other forms. And of course, Discovery um, is a web-based um, um, application that will... Uh, we just wanted to be able to reduce the amount of effort in, for those consented um, patients, the amount of effort that we would have to redo getting the data into the, the database. And so we try to uh, pull as many fields directly from the EMR as we can to popu populate the Discovery database. I just wanted to follow up with this idea of leveraging such uh, information for public health. So one question is, do you have a system in place where you can take these, these reports essentially and send them to the FDA as, a, as an FDA report? Because frankly, you could have the potential for an interface, not just for research, where you pull data but, and, and patient management when issues come up to deal with um, in real time, but also to report publicly to the FDA. And we're very interested in getting such kinds of high quality information. Uh, so that's a very interesting comment. Um, a few years ago at another um, meeting here in, in um, 
um, Washington, um, uh, Diane Murphy uh, came up and, and uh, wanted us to consider um, making a pediatric, uh, designing a pediatric MedWatch form because there's lots of information that pediat pediatricians are interested in um, that aren't included in the current MedWatch form. And so we pursued that and, and, uh, and then we were, we were told, well, not to bother because there was no way at the FDA to, uh, to change the, um, um, the information that was being uh, collected. So I, uh, I, um, I can't answer the question exactly, but I believe that we are manually um, entering or submitting um, some of the more serious ones to, um, um, to FAIRS, but I'd have to go back and check with uh, um, our folks. Uh, it would be nice to automate it. It should be automatable. But it would also be um, important to include information that pediatrics, pediatricians find relevant, like um, a vaccination history and that well, sort of stuff. We can talk offline about this, but okay. there are ways to do this relatively expeditiously as an attachment so that you don't really have to spend too much time fooling around with the computer. And I do have another uh, contact. Yeah, we can talk about that after. I have another contact at the FDA who was interested in this as well. If you had uh, decision support built into the information that's in your allergy and, and ADR information and I, I mean I think it's great that you've organized it because it's such a, allergy boxes are such a wastebasket of irrelevant information and distractors that lead to bad patient care um, and and I wondered if you had decision support um, that you've actually you know actually followed up on for instance if someone actually is labeled as having an ADR to amoxicillin, if a child is labeled as has, having an ADR to amoxicillin, do clinicians really act on that in a way that they will actually give that? Because, you know, what, what usually happens is a amoxicillin is in the allergy box, but it clearly states a, a, a side effect that is not an allergy, but people will still avoid giving it. So have you actually followed up to see if actually your organization of information makes a difference, or do you actually have actual active pharmacist involvement and reconciliation of information as patients are followed up in your system? So there are, uh, there are a couple of dimensions to that question. Uh, so in terms of the, um, the allergy business, we do make referrals. Um, the, the, the Adverse Drug Reaction Group does make referrals to allergy um, when there is a suspicion of an allergic mechanism being involved. Um, in terms of the um, information that's available, I, I don't know if I would describe it as a formal decision support um, per se, but uh, under the final severity in the, in the um, EMR, um, these are the categories. And if you can't read them, um, uh, final severity is unknown. Uh, then we have um, life-threatening, delayed discharge, permanent disability, which are severe. Um, but uh, down here are, are, is information that could be uh, useful in terms of, uh, you know, the, uh, the um, drug should be um, stopped. Um, uh, I, think, I think we have, the, there, I didn't include it for time, but there, there are recommendations um, in the EMR as to whether the drug or, or the same class of drug can be um, um, considered safely in, in the future. Uh, we don't know. Um, how well, at least I don't know how well that's being followed. I don't know if the folks have, uh, have chased up on some of that. Uh, actually, going back to the cost effectiveness, we were actually considering looking at the use of azithromycin, um, be increasing with the, uh, the, uh, with the number of um, uh, beta-lactam-related allergies that were in the system that were, were not allergies, but um, I don't know the results of that um, either. Uh, the short answer is that, that we are trying to provide guidance, but it's not a formal um, decision support thing at this, at this stage. Um, yeah, hi, I had a question, just a logistics. So you have well, a staff person uh, at the hospital who gets contacted every time this box is checked? Is that what my understanding was? Yes, we do. It's a clinical. So the, the, one, the one position that's, that is um, supported um, solely for this pro, uh, program and the, um, is a clinical pharmacist who is in our Division of Clinical Pharmacology. Um, we also, as, as part of our clinical pharmacology program, we have a um, sort of a personalized medicine consult service, individual pediatric, individualized pediatric therapeutics consult service. Um, some of the people who are um, affiliated with that 
um, service also um, enter data. And it, it's being extended now where if, if a button is triggered in a particular unit and there is a clinical pharmacist in that unit, um, they are now starting to, uh, they, we are training them to, uh, to collect the information. It's, you know, the program is expanding, uh, expanding when you, um, uh, we get more buy-in and we get people actually interested and, and committed to this as, as a value to the institution. So they're mostly pharmacy trained then? That's the uh, training of the people involved in, in this? Right. We have uh, pharmacists, um, uh, physicians, and um, I, I believe uh, a couple of people who have entered reports have been nurses as well. So I think at this point we're going to open the floor for general discussion. Thank you very much, Dr. Leader.